Well, it's always the backup from last year, anyways. Um, okay, let's get rid of this. Cool. Um, konnichiwa, Eban-san. Um, yeah, cool beans. So, uh, Crash Course, hello. I split online and face-to-face, -face, so I'll probably mostly talk towards the, the thing so that people can hear me. Um, but you guys can see that there. You guys have got uh, online, you, you've got the screen share. I'll monitor the chat as well for online people, so please put messages in there if you have questions. And you guys can either yell at me or put your hand up if you have questions about stuff. Um, yeah, let's um, let's let's get into it. Real quick, mm. can I also record you on my phone as like a sample of how you're doing things? Sure. Yeah, because <laughs> you can't really see. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Right. No worries. Um, cool beans. Where was I? I was going to say something important and then I've forgotten what it is, so that's okay. Um, yeah, so you guys have the exam paper. I'm not going to display the exam paper on the screen. So face to face people is at the front if you don't have it already, otherwise on your computer. Um, online people just split screen vibes. Uh, and yeah, so I'll have most of the question. I'll be talking about the question. You guys can just follow along. Um, what we're going to do is we'll have a two hour crash course. So we'll do um, questions one and two roughly, and then we'll have a five minute break and then we'll keep going with the the second half and uh, yeah, what I've done is I've just picked out some uh, examples from past papers that you probably don't have access to. Most of them I know you don't have access to, you might have access to 2009 on the LSOC resources, but I just picked out one question because it was a nice question. Um, so most of them are ones that you haven't seen before, which is nice so that I'm not just regurgitating content from stuff you've, you've already got access to. Uh, in terms of the exam, um, well, it will be the whole course, probably an emphasis on the second half of the course, given that you've done a midterm, but still expect something like, you know, what's the gate input cost and some of products sort of vibes, even though I probably won't do it today. Um, I know that probably some of you are a little bit hesitant, probably at the last week of stuff, the TTLs, CMOS, the transistors and the CMOS. Um, I don't think you really need to worry about the TTL stuff for the exam. I have a sneaking suspicion. And CMOS is something that you should worry about. So we'll cover a question about that today. Cool. So we'll get started then. The first question, nice introduction, um, just some combinational logic stuff is uh, this Boolean function here. And um, this is kind of nice because you can go and do this, right? And it's going to be um, different for, for you guys than it is for me because your ZIDs are going to be different. Therefore, your Boolean function is going to be different. Um, you can't see because I've printed it black and white. Can anyone tell me which digit is the one that's blue? If you're looking at it on your computer or red. Yeah, I did. Oopsie, yes. there. The sixth one. Okay, thank you. Cool. So um, my ZID is five one six two three eight eight. So therefore, we got eight as our our digit there. But you guys can do it with different digits. And so if we were to go and um, well, let's make that a little bit more. No, I don't want that. Uh, make that a little bit bigger so I don't run out of space later on. I'll put it over there. Why are you so slow? Cool. Um, and to save all the hassle of translating that, um, I'm just going to go and write out exactly what this is after you swap the Ws, Xys and Zs for Acs and Ds. So G is, that's a huge, how do we, um, That's better. Cool. Um, G is equal to A bar C D plus A bar B C bar D bar plus A B bar C D plus A B C D bar. So that's our um, equation. And the question is asking us to implement this circuit using a four to one multiplexer and the least amount of external logic gates. So how do we do combinational circuits with multiplexes? This is the whole point of this question. Um, so what we're going to do is, before we do anything, uh, we're going to write out the truth table. 
because to do the multiplexer questions, we need to look at how the output actually looks. So we're going to fill out this truth table, and I really should have done this earlier, but let's just quickly do it now. So after we've wasted five minutes drawing up a truth table, we've got this, the G now. So what we want to do is we want to generate G from this expression. Now, it's definitely not going to work if you just look at the expression and fill out the things here. So a fast way of doing this is to break it out into your four terms here and to just consider them one at a time. Because if we all them all together, then it's just going to be one when any of those terms are true. So let's consider them one at a time and see what the, the truth table uh, ends up looking like. So if we look at the first one, A bar C D, actually that's a tricky one, let's not do that one first. Let's do A bar B C D bar. We know that that's only going to be true when A is 0, B is 1, C is 0, and D is 0. And so that corresponds to 0, 1, 0, 0. So I know that at that particular point in my true table it's going to be a 1. It's just a min term, right? So I'm going to go and do that for the rest of them as well. So A, B bar, C, D is going to be 1, 0, 1, 1, wherever that one is there. Uh, the next one, A, B, C, D bar is going to be 1, 1, 1, 0, uh, which is a 1 there. And now we come to the last term, A bar, C, D. Now we know that that has to be true whenever A is 0, C is 1, and D is 1. So A is only 0 in the first half here. So we're just going to look at the first half of the truth table. When it's C and D both one, well, that's going to occur here and also down here as well. So that ends up with our truth table. Now we're just going to fill in all the zeros for where those uh, terms were not. So it's a nice, easy way of generating a truth table um, by breaking it up into, into the terms there. Cool. So now we've got our truth table. We can actually, uh, is it, have I screwed it up? A bar B, C bar D. Uh, oh well. Um, I think the second one should be fine, uh, sorry, because Z should be inverted in the um, in the second term. Oh, sorry, uh, not sorry, um, Evan. But let me know if I'm not correct. Uh, I think it's fine. Anyway, we keep going with what it is. It doesn't really matter what the the thing is. So we've got we've got our. Um, We've got our truth table. Now we're going to say, how do we implement this with the multiplexer? It asks us for a, a four to one multiplexer. So remember that a four to one multiplexer has four inputs, two select lines, and one output. And based on the select lines, it will connect a particular input to uh, an output there. So how do we do this? The way that we do this is, if you remember from your, uh, your labs, uh, when we did this in the lab, um, because it's four to one, we know that we have four inputs. So we have to split up our true table into four sections, like so. And then each one of these is going to correspond to one of these four inputs. So if you had a two to one multiplexer, you would just divide your true table into two and do the same thing, right? All right. So if we're happy with that, then um, the next step is to generate the output G for each of these four sections. So if we look at the um, the first four up here, we can see that's 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, and so we need to generate G in terms of A, B, C, and D. Now, in our question, it says that we're using A, B as the select lines. So that means I'm going to have A here and B there. And that means that we're probably going to focus on C and D as what we're going to use to generate the Boolean expression for G for the first four rows of that truth table. So can anyone tell me what the Boolean expression for G is in the first four rows just out of C and D? C D, right? It's it's um it's just it's just C D because uh, it's one when both C and D are one. Perfect. If we have a look at the next one then, the next one's slightly more tricky. Maybe you need to make a K map. I'm not going to. It looks like in uh, X nor gate, right? 
And so I'm going to say that this is uh, C D bar plus uh, D C bar um, exclusive naught. So that's an exclusive naught of uh, C and D, right? So that would be C exclusive odd with D, or and that's just the same as this line down here. Cool. The third one again, just C D, and the fourth one is going to be C D bar. So those are our four expressions then for um, the four lines for our multiplexer. So now the question is, now we've got the equations, we've got to actually make the logic. Now, if there's no restriction on this, that's really easy. The first one's just an AND gate, and the second one's just an exclusive NOR, and so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, the question tells us that we've got to do this with NOR gates, and not only NOR gates, we've got to do it with three input NOR gates. So that's a bit of a pain, but probably good practice for us anyways. So let's do this with... Um, Let's do this with the three input NOR gates. So let's look at the, the first one, the, the C, C, D. Um, the way that we're going to do this if we're doing it with NOR gates is firstly use De Morgan's law to get it in terms of ORs rather than ANDs. So the whole idea here is to get it in terms of ORs and negations because the same as like with a NAND gate. With a NAND gate, you know how you invert it by just connecting the two inputs together? That's your inverter for a NAND gate. Exactly the same for a NOR gate. So if we're in a NOR gate, if um, if we had something like this, doesn't matter how many inputs there are, there's three. If we connect them together, if this was Q, this would be Q bar at the output. So if we can express our Boolean equations for the four inputs to the marks in terms of OR and negations, then that's really easy. We can just go and make that with our three input NOR gates. Uh, okay, so let's get rid of, oh, maybe I'll leave that there just in case. Okay, so with the C and the D, let's um, let's move down here a little bit and um, and work on CD. So if we have CD, uh, how might we turn that into something that's made of ORs and negations? It's a particular theorem that I might want to use. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So what does the Morgans do? How does it work? All right, good revision. Uh, you do a double, in this case, you do a double negation. Right. Um, and then you would... Right. So what we do is we negate the entire thing. We change ands for ors. Whoops, I don't want exclusive or. And we invert all of the the terms. Right. So three steps. Firstly, um, change and for or or for and. Secondly, invert all the terms. Thirdly, negate the entire thing. So that's De Morgan's. Okay. So now we've done De Morgan's. This is nice because this looks like a nor of C bar and D bar. And so to do something like this, we would just have to um, negate C and D first. So we've got C and therefore C bar and D and D bar. So now that we've negated um, C and D, now we can just do a nor of C bar and D bar, right? So I can connect that to that and that to that. Now I have a third input for my uh, NOR gate. What do I want to connect the input to? Zero. To ground, because that's not going to change the way that a NOR gate functions. And if we're doing this with NAND gates, what would I connect to? One. BCZ, right? So we're just going to connect that one to ground there. And that way it functions like a two input NOR gate. All righty, so we've done CD. Um, going back up here, we can see that CD was used twice, uh, so that's good. We've done half of the work. Um, now let's have a look at, at CD bar. And if we do CD bar exactly the same way, uh, we'll just do it quickly because it's pretty simple. We're going to say by De Morgan's, that's going to be C bar plus D. So it's going to be the same thing. Uh, we're going to have our, our NOR gate and we're going to have C as one input. D bar, which we've already generated as another input, and the third input to to ground there. Um, what about you just use D complement as two of the inputs? Uh, where would that be, Alex? Oh, I think that was potentially an earlier question that I asked, but let me know. I'll keep looking at the chat. Um, cool. So that one was our, our C, 
Deba, and that one was um, C and D. And the last one that we need to do is then our disgusting exclusive nor up here. So um, C D bar plus D C bar. So let's let's go let's go down here and have a look at uh, C D bar uh, plus D C bar on the gated. And we can see that we've already done uh, C D bar somewhere. Yeah, we've done C D bar already. So we don't need to worry about this term. We're just going to do D C bar. Um, and so that's going to look like so we'll have D C bar ground and oh, it's a nor. And then we're going to have another nor with the already generated uh, C D bar. And then finally, that one will just be um, grounds there. And that will be our C D bar plus D C bar. Yes. Uh, how would I transform C D? So C bar D bar plus C D. True. Um, it becomes more disgusting unless you like realize that it's an exclusive nor. So if we had um, C C bar D bar plus C D, is it that's what you're saying? Right? Yeah. So you could go and generate like um, like this first. Yeah. Right. We know we know how to do that. Um, because we've just done that sort of thing there. And so then what you'd have to do is you'd have to have the the nor of, well, C bar, D bar, and then C, D, and ground. And then you'd have to invert the entire thing again, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's disgusting. But if you recognize that you can translate it to what I've written down over here, the C, D bar plus D, C bar with the, the or at the top, then that's probably easier. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, because that's an XOR, you're just writing it down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So one of the implementations is going to be easier than the other. You'll get marks for both, but one of them. All right, Alex says, when you know C bar and D bar together, if you have one input being C bar and two being D bar, um, I think that would also work. Yep, yeah, Alex, that's that's also fine. Uh, yeah, nice thoughts. Cool. So we've generated our four inputs. It's a little bit messy. But let's just come back to the original problem. The original problem was to do this with a multiplexer. And so we've got the multiplexer. And all we're just going to do is literally just, just I'm just going to write it um, because I can't be bothered to draw the wires uh, and then CD bar there. And that would just be how your multiplexer looks. Just make sure you define exactly what those guys look like, like I've done down the bottom there. Are there any questions with doing that with uh, NOR gates? Cool. Or multiplexes in general. Cool. Awesome. Um, righto. The next part of the question says do the same thing but using a decoder and three input NAND gates. So, yeah, we get to do it the other way as well. Um, with a decoder, uh, hopefully you remember from your labs that the way you work with a decoder and a truth table, let's maybe pull this all the way over to the right hand side now. Um, the way that we work with a decoder and a truth table is that we just look at when all of the, uh, the inputs are. Are uh, one. Sorry, all the outputs are one at the uh, in the truth table. Let's turn that down. Cool. So that's going to be yeah, all of these min terms here. Um, and then what we can do then is like ideally what you'd have is you'd have your your four to sixteen decoder, where these are going to be A, B, C, D. And then you're going to have your three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, your 16 outputs. And then you, what you want to do is you want to, you want to all, all of these uh, min terms together. So like this one and the next one and so on and so forth. But the question says you got to do it with three input NAND gates. And so we've just got to translate our OR expression into a uh, three input NAND gate uh, implementation instead. Um, and I probably, I don't know, do people want me to do that or should I move on? Do it? Yep, cool. All right, we can do that. So I think the, the easiest way here is because you want to, you want to OR it. Let's let's write out exactly what we want to OR together. So our, our G in terms of our min terms is going to be, uh, what is it, M3 
odd with M4, odd with M7, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, odd with uh, 12, 13, 14. So that's our expression. And then to convert it into something with three input, NAND gates prefer when to use De Morgan's to convert the ORs to a, an AND. So if we use De Morgan's on this, it's going to look like, remember we, we swap all the uh, ORs for ANDs, we negate all the terms, and we put a negation over the entire, um, the entire function. So that's going to look like so. Cool. So now that we've got this uh, like like this, it's uh, probably uh, a little bit confusing because we have to use three input NAND gates. This would be great for a five input NAND gate, but we can't do that. So how do we do this with the three input NAND gates? Well, let's just start by chucking um, three, four, and seven into a, a three input NAND gate. So now that we've got these, that's generated this term here, but with an extra negation on top of it. Because it's not just an AND, it's a NAND, right? And so to get rid of that extra negation, we're just going to do the same trick of just passing it through another NAND gate. And now this is the same as the blue box in the expression. So I looked at those three terms and treated them like an AND. But because I'm uh, working with NANDs, I've got to get rid of this, this bubble here. And to do that, I just added an inverter at the end there. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions? Cool. Um, all right. So now that we've done that, we can just look at the other two. And uh, I've forgotten something really important. These are all negated. I need to have a, uh, an inverter on every single one of these. Because every term in that expression is negated individually, I need to have an inverter on all of them. And so what are the other two? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 14. Cool. Forgot that, sorry. Um, and now that we've done that, we just need to have one more three input NAND gate for the finale, which is to take this one, that one, and that one together, and that makes the entire, uh, the entire expression. Cool. Any questions? Yes. For the, uh, for the first part, yep. how we want to capture this, yep. can we draw the more combination circuit first? Like, do we have to connect the more part to the multiplexer? I don't think so. If you saw what I did, I just drew it separately and labeled it, yeah. and I think that's, that. that's fine. Otherwise, your diagram gets really messy. So, yeah, yeah. As long as you've got the NOR implementation somewhere, yeah. Wouldn't you have to invert again at output because? Um, because the entire thing has this this inversion on it. Um, I don't don't have to have a, an inverter again at the output. So remember that this last, like the entire term, is really just the NAND of all of these terms below it. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, because of that bar over the top. Yeah. Sorry, just something to ask if. Yeah. Same for the output part, I only have three outputs with once. How do I convert the last? So with a decoder and like. So for like a bus, I remember seeing something like when I only have three outputs, do I connect the last one to one? Three outputs. Three inputs. Three inputs, three inputs to your marks. Yeah. Uh, why would you ever only have three inputs to your marks? Because what happens if like G is, there's only three ones? Okay, so remember it's not actually related to the number of ones, it's related to the number of rows in your truth table, right? So even if there were like, um, if this was like a zero and that was a zero, is that what you're saying, right? Yeah, 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 that's what I mean. Well, I mean, again, what you'd have to do then is you would have to look at, we still break it into our four sections, right? And then the first one's really easy. What's the, what's oh, G? It's, zero. it's just zero. I see. And the second one, CD, yep. right? And then so on. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, it doesn't actually have to do with the um, the values in the output. Oh, okay. It's uh, it's just you break it up into those four. Yeah. So that that will be just connected to zero. Correct. With grams. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, there are some questions. Okay. Why does the first half have an extra NAND? 
Um, I assume that you're talking about this one that I've highlighted here. Star, is that is that correct? Yeah, I think that Shabelle and Nicholas have the, the right idea. I'll, I'll keep going and explain it for those who might be wondering. So what, um, let's, let's change color to red. Um, at, at this point in us, oh my God, it's too thick. All right, let's go. Um, at this point in the circuit, um, what we've got, I might call this H. Um, H is equal to, what have we got? We've got the inverse of M3, the inverse of M4, and the inverse of M7. And these are all NANDed together, right? So would you, yeah, you get it for the inversion. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so then because of that, we need to, because all we want to do is we actually just want to have this expression without the, the inversion over the top, like the NAND, uh, then we need to add this extra inverter in here to actually get what is in the the uh, the blue box down the bottom the bottom left here, because there is there's no negation over that end, right? And so um, because of that, we really only want a three input end. We don't want this negation here, so we cancel that negation with the with the end at the end. Was that your was that your question? Yeah, easy, cool. Um, all righty. I think that's that's that. Um, the last the last one's kind of interesting because it says design something using uh, tri-state buffers or three-state buffers. So we'll go through that quickly as well, and then move on to uh, question two. So the last part is saying um, do do it with uh, tri-state buffers. I'm just gonna remake this a little bit because I've scribbled over the top. All right. So how do we do this with tri-state buffers? Um, what is a tri-state buffer? It's got, yeah, it's got a, an input and also an enable. And when the enable is one, the input becomes like the output is just follows the input. And when the enable is zero, it's a high impedance, right? And because of that, um, tri-state buffers are really cool because it means that you can uh, you can do something like this now with your with your logic gates. If I have two tri-state buffers. I can connect them together as long as I have an enable here and the complement of the enable there. And what that means then is that there's only one of these uh, buffers, let's call them one and two, one of these buffers are going to be driving the, uh, the output wire, let's call it O, at any one point. And so this is the only time that you can connect the outputs together. I'm sure many of you have problems in Verilog where you're driving a wire with multiple sources or something like that. Um, this is the problem here, uh, except that you were doing it with two NAND gates or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, this is awesome because we can just like join the, the outputs together. So how do we use this to help us to implement the, the function that we've been given purely with tri-state buffers? Um, it's, uh, yeah. Wouldn't this act as a, a one to two mocks if you have to cascade it? Yeah, well, exactly, because like a two to one is just like, yeah, two, yeah, exactly. What I've drawn is literally just a, a two to one mocks, right? Um, and so you'll find that it, it actually looks um, very similar to the, the mux implementation, right? Uh, specifically, we know it's going to be very similar because it's asking us to use A and B to enable the three state buffers. So rather than having enable here, I'm actually going to have, why is it so slow? Uh, I'm actually going to have something like A and A bar there. And uh, sorry, Alex has a question. Will there be a very log question in the exam? Um, if they're mean, they'll ask you to write very log. Uh, but if they're nice, I'll just ask you to interpret some very log. So we'll cover that later in the crash course. Uh, we'll come to that later. Um, all right, so how do we do this? As um, Asama said, we're going to break this into four sections exactly like the marks. And that's because what we can do is maybe I'll draw this out first and then we'll come back to the, the, the truth table. If we have um, A and A complement here, then we can go a little bit further and split this up into 
something like this where we have B and B complement. And we can do exactly the same thing down here for B and B complement. And what that means is that if A is zero and B is zero, then we can see the this one is going to be on or enabled. And also this one's going to be on and enabled. And so your path then looks like this. And so this is exactly like the multiplexer, right? Because all we're going to do is take the function for the first four and apply them to the input here. So when A is zero and B is zero, if we remember from that first one, it was just um, CD, right? And now there's no requirement on like using NANDs or NORs. So now we can we can actually just draw it with uh, a NAND gate. But I can't be bothered to do that. You would have to do that in your exam. I'm going to leave that for you guys to do. Um, so if we have a look at the, the next one then, if we look up here, um, this is when, this is the case where uh, A is still zero, but B is one. So if we go back up to our, our truth table then, we can see that that corresponds to the second four elements. And we saw that was the exclusive nor of C and D. And so we can just, I'm just going to write it again. You guys would have to draw it. Um, we can just say something like this for the moment. So that's the exclusive nor in C and D. Does everyone have the, have, I understand what we're doing here with the three state buffers. So we're effectively making a, a multiplexer out of them. Cool. Uh, yeah. Cool. And then the same applies for the last two. When A is uh, 1 and B is 0, uh, from our truth table, that was C, D, I think. And then the last one, A is 1, um, B is 1, that was just uh, C, D or bar or D, C bar? I can't remember. C, D bar. Okay. So, yep. If we've thrown it in the first Well, uh, what have you drawn it with three input NOR gates, right? This question says use uh, other logic, yeah? As in, like, you can use whatever you want. Um, I think if you were to do that, like, they'd probably give you most of the marks, but obviously it's a high gate input cost, right? As opposed to just drawing out the, for example, for CD, that's just an end, right? So that's a gate input cost of two, whereas when we did it before, it was a gate input cost of, like, six or something. Yep. Yeah, makes sense. So probably best, it takes you five seconds, but yeah. like to draw it out, like actually. Oh, yeah. Cool. All righty. Um, that's question one. Does anyone have any questions about that one before we move on to the next question? Yeah. With a question like this, would it be fine if I just draw like a two to one box and just treat them as blocks? So like, if I, have... I think you'd have to explicitly say that the two to one, like define what it looks like in terms of tri-state buffers. And then, and then cascade them. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be fine. Yeah. But that's also not a whole lot of drawing. Well, yeah. So. <laughs> In case we get a big one. Cool. Um, question two. We'll probably move a bit quicker through question two because um, you've just done this for your assignment. So you're all pros at this. Uh, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but it's a state machine uh, sort of thing. And so let's go and have a look at the white. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. No, take me back. Ah. All right. Cool. So if you can see on your paper, you've got this state machine here. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Oh, not that big. All right, perfect. So we've got this state machine here, and the, the first question is to write the state transition table for a Mealy machine. Um, so the state diagram is a Mealy machine because the outputs depend on the current state and the inputs. That's nice. We can just go straight to our um, our state diagram there. So let's let's quickly fill that one out. Um, so we're going to go with the present states A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Okay, and the next state. So if we look at A, um, if we have an input of zero, our next state is going to be B. If we have an input of one, our next state is C. And the outputs for those ones are going to be one and one. And I'm just choosing them straight off here, right? Because this is like input, output. 
Um, if I make a mistake while I'm doing this, can someone just like shout at me? Um, all right, so at B, if our input is zero, our next state is E with an output of zero. If I'm at B and my input is one, my next state is G with an output of zero. And C, if I'm at C uh, and my input is zero, my next state is just C with an output of one. Otherwise, it's going to be A with an output of zero. For D, um, next state will be D zero. Otherwise, B one. Uh, where are we? E. Where's E? Uh, okay, so F output of one and C output of one. And then we'll go F. F is H with an output of zero and D with an output of zero and then G, G output of zero, uh, F output one and then H next state would be or F output one, C output one. Did I get that right? Is that legit, I think? Yeah. Let me know if I screwed something up. Um, yeah, so uh, Anshul, the, the recording will be like, I'll post a link to the recording. It's actually being recorded this time. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll post a link to the recording after probably this afternoon or this evening. So don't worry if you have to leave. Um, okay, so we've done the straight tangent transition table. Now let's um, let's have a look at minimizing the number of states for this one. So how we minimize the number of states is using an implication table, which you all would have used in your assignment, right? Yeah. Good. Uh, don't don't frighten me like that. I'm marking your assignment. I'll know. Um, okay. So. What we need to do is we use an implication table, which is this staircase thing. And the way this works is we just kind of list the states down the side. We start with the second one just because you don't want to like match A and A because of course A and A are the same thing. Um, so like this and then A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then what we do is we look at the next state and outputs for a particular state. And we're going to start with A. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this column here. We're going to, going, to, going to compare A to every single other state in our table. And we're going to say, is the next state and the output equivalent? Well, the first thing it's going to say is the output equivalent. Because if the output is not the same, then there's no chance of minimizing or saying those two states are the same. If the outputs are the same, then there is a chance that we could minimize. And so what we'll do then is we'll say, all right, what is the condition upon the next states being the same? So... We're going to look at A and we're going to compare it. We're going to start with B. So we're going to compare these two rows and we say, all right, are the outputs the same? No, therefore they cannot be uh, the same state. And so the, what I'm going to do there is I'm just going to put an X in the implication table. All righty. So we've done that. And now we just go and compare A to C. So we'll look at, at this one here. And if we compare A to C, the outputs are still not the same, therefore not equivalent. D not equivalent E. E is equivalent, right? Because we can see that the outputs are the same uh, for both A and E. The problem here is that the next states aren't the same. So we can't immediately say that we can condense these into one state. What we have to say is we've got to say, let's get rid of the highlights. Uh, we're going to say that, we'll go red again. Um, if these two are going to be the same, that means that B has to be the same as F and C uh, has to be the same as C. Now I can probably omit saying C is the same as C because we know that that's correct. So the only condition upon A and E being equivalent states is that B and F are also equivalent states. So we'll leave that condition there. It's not quite true yet, but we'll see what happens when we compare B and F. All right, so we keep going down the, the rest of the table. Where's the only other place where the outputs are the same for A? H. H, cool. So look at H, and what am I going to write in my box for H? Um, the F. The F. B depends on F. Yep, and the other one, CC. All right, we don't have to write that. Cool. Um, all righty. So we've done the first row, and that's comparing A to everything else. Now we've got to do the same for B. So we'll compare. So we'll look at um, this column in our implication table, 
and we're going to compare B to every single other state. And we can have a look just very briefly. Zero, zero only matches with F. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to put X's everywhere apart from F because if the outputs are different, they can't be the same. Now, the condition upon B and F being the same is E, H, and G, D. So let's write those ones down as well. So that one's E, H, and G, D. All righty. Now let's keep going for C. C is 1, 0. The only place it matches is nowhere. So nothing for C because there's no other 1, 0 outputs in our in our output there. So there's nothing that matches 1, 0. Um, and then finally, we've got, no, sorry, not finally, we've got a couple more to go. D, so 0, 1. So 0, 1 will match with that 0, 1 there. And the condition upon those being the same is, well, which one was it? It was G. The condition upon um, D and G being the same is that D and G have to be the same. And also that B and F have to be the same. Uh, I'll come back and talk about the DG dependence in a second. Um, if you look at E11, one, one, uh, so this one and this one, if we look at E, the only time 1, 1 matches below is going to be with H. And so we can go and write out the dependencies there as well. So that means that F and C, F and F have to be equivalent, C and C have to be equivalent. Okay, because the entire output and next state are the same now, we can just say that E and H are equivalent states. So I'm going to just put a tick in that box there. All righty. So if that's... Uh, that's that one then, and then we've just got to finish off F, and we can see that both F and G don't match in terms of output, so I'm just going to put X's there. So once we've filled out the implication table, are we done? Yeah? No? We're not done. So we've said that E and H are the same. Now we've got to go back through and basically work out, based on these dependencies that I wrote there, there's a formal name for them. What are they called? Does anyone remember? I can't remember the top of my head. Hmm? Yeah, something like that. It's in your lecture notes. Go have a look. Um, and so we're going to go and cross out the ones that um, are true or not true. So if we have a look at DG, we can see that DG has a dependency for D and G. And that's something that we can just automatically say, OK, well, that just like proves itself true. So I'm going to cross that out because if DG depends on DG, then that's like saying nothing, right? So that's fine. We can cross that one out there. And now we can see that DG depends on F, uh, BF. All right, let's have a look at BF then. BF depends on GD and also on EH. And we can see that EH was already um, marked as equivalent states. So we can just go and cross that one out because that one's now true. We don't have to worry about it anymore. And what we can say now is that, yes, BF depends on GD, and GD also depends on BF. And because they depend on each other, these are therefore equivalent states. So I can say that because GD depends on BF and BF depends on GD, these are the same. So now I have three equivalent states, or well, three boxes I've checked. Sorry? Yes. And because I've now checked that BF is, um, is a, like that dependency is fine, I'm now going to go and mark these two as also um, equivalent. So if we go and write out the results of this then, we can see that A, looking up this column here, A is uh, the same state as E and is also the same state as H. Now, if we look at B, uh, we can say that B is the same as F because we're looking at, at these ones now for the ticks. And we can also say the very last one is they're going to say that um, D is going to be equal to G, looking at uh, this one in particular. Um, I haven't looked at one of them, EH, and that's because that EH is already captured there, so I don't have to write it again. Um, any questions? Is that three state or four state? Sorry? Is that three state or four state? This, this, has, this can be called G. Well, okay. Um, did I do anything with C? No. So C is just C, right? So now I've got four states. Um, Sarah says, because EH is the same, does that imply GD is 
what is that word? To I have no idea what that word is. Because eh is the same. Yeah, because eh is the same, I can cross out. Um, I can cross out like this one here. Was that what you were asking? Um, does that imply G E H is the same? Does that imply G D is two since the same box? Um, where was G D? Uh, no, I think. What do we have in the G D box? So G D is B F. Um, e H doesn't imply G D. Uh, so E H was only referenced up in the B F box, and that was. Uh, and so that's why we, we looked at BF. Um, so EH didn't have any relationship to GD. It was just it was just in, in this this um, that dependency there. Um, but because because of the EH, that meant that now BF and uh, GD were like mutual dependencies, and so we could kind of cross them out. Was that what you're asking, or? I'll wait for you to type in the chat. Um, or you can turn your mic on, alternatively. I think uh, we should be able to hear you, maybe. All right. Uh, any questions about state minimization? Cool. Uh, and I'll just keep an eye on the chat. Sick. So now we've got our four states, um, A, B, C, and D. Uh, we can go ahead and we can rewrite our, um, our state transition table. So oh, I'm going to have to draw this up. Oh, well. Um, present, so Sam Nickel says, so inst inst instances of mutual dependencies can always be marked as true. Yeah, so if we, in this case, for example, we had um, GD depending on BF and BF depending on uh, GD, and so because of that, um, yes, we can we can say that they are, uh, we can put ticks on, on those squares in the implication table. Yeah. Um, these should all be in rules in your lecture notes somewhere. There's a, a slide somewhere that has all the rules. All right, let's write out the present state, the next state, um, and the output z, x equals zero, x equals one. Um, and let's do it for a, b, c, d. And so what we just need to do is we just need to substitute into our um, state table exactly what we did. So this one won't change because we've just got B and C here. So uh, we're just going to leave B and C there and the outputs are not going to change either. Um, B goes to E and G. Now, E is now A, so I'm going to write an A there, and G is now D, so I'm going to write a D there. Um, and that leaves us with the outputs 0, 0. I'm just going to do all the outputs right now. Uh, 0, 1, perfect. C, C, A, nothing changes there, and then D, B. And so that's our, um, our minimized state table. Cool. That's, uh, yes, it can be done using four states and they're your four states. Perfect. Um, cool. The last part before, well, probably the most difficult part then is converting this Mealy machine uh, to a, a more machine. Right, hang on, Sarah says, uh, since the BF box contained the potential for EH and GD and EH was proved elsewhere. The only reason, yeah, that's right. So now because I've proved EH, I can sort of cross it out as a dependency because it's already satisfied. And uh, now GD is dependent on BF and BF is dependent on GD. And then I can go and do what Nikhil said is uh, um, by mutual dependencies. Um, that's correct. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Cool. Um, all right, so we're going to convert this Mealy machine to an equivalent more machine. Um, let's let's do this using the diagram because I think this is always a little bit easier using a using a diagram than it is for uh, doing it on an actual state table. Uh, so let's go and redraw out the diagram that corresponds to uh, this. Oh, I kind of want this box. Let's move this box. Move it, no. Ah, oh, here we go. Perfect. All right. Um, so let's let's go and draw this out as a state diagram and then convert it to the more equivalent. 
So let's let's go and draw A. A is here, and it goes to um, B, and that's going to be with an input of zero and an output of one, and it goes to C, where we have an input of one, and that also gives us an output of one. So C, so B, B goes to A, uh, when we have an input of zero, and that gives us an output of zero, and B goes to D, when we have an input of one, and uh, that also gives us an output of zero. Uh, C goes to C when we have an input of zero and an output of uh, one. And then C goes to A when we have an input of one with an output of zero. Uh, lastly, D goes to D when we have an input of zero and that gives us an output of zero. And then finally, D will go back to B if we have an input of one with an output of one. So what we do... Um, with this, when we convert it, is we take the outputs. The outputs need to be now part of the, the present state. So with a mealy machine, the outputs really just correspond to the, the next state that we're going to. And the idea behind a mealy machine is that we sample those outputs just before the clock edge. That's how it works. So for this one, um, rather than the outputs kind of representing what the next state should be, we want it to be the present state. And so we're going to push the outputs um, along the arrows into the state that they're pointing to. So, for example, if we have a look at A, we can see that there are two arrows going into A, one from uh, C and one from B, and um, we want to push them into A. So in our new state diagram, I'm going to have A, and it's going to have an output of zero. We can see that both of these outputs are, are zeros. Um, so that's nice and easy. If they were different, what would I need to do? Break it out into like a, an A an A zero and an, an A one sort of vibe, right? And then you'd have like one going here and one going there. But we don't have to because the outputs are the same along both of the incoming uh, edges. Okay, let's get rid of that. Cool. So we've got A with a zero, and then we're going to have B. If we look at B, the inputs going into, sorry, the arrows going into B both have an output of one. So that's also nice and easy. I can just draw it uh, like this. And C, so for C, the output's going to be what? One. one, and that's on both of them. So that's fine. This is really easy, isn't it? So <laughs> Jonah picked a good example. Um, all right, and then we have it like that. And of course, all of the edges are still going to have the same inputs. So if we pull that down a little bit, that's going to be a zero. This is going to be a, uh, a zero as well. Um, that's one. That's one. This is zero. Uh, where are we? This is one. This is one. And that's also zero. So the, the actual arrows don't change. We just push the outputs into the state that we're going into. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. Okay, so that was nice and easy. And the last couple of questions are doing the flip-flop and output equations and so on and so forth. Do people want me to do that? Or are we happy, given that you did the assignment, that you're pretty much pros at doing this for every time? You want me to do it? You want me to do it? Okay, all right. We'll, we'll skim through it. We'll skim through it. Um, Yep. Okay, cool. No stress. Uh, Nicholas says, if the idea with Mealy is to sample just before the clock edge, um, do, just, does the more machine have to be sampled just after the clock edge? Excellent question. Um, the more machine is basically means that when we go to the next state, or I should talk to you here, uh, when we go to the next state that the outputs represent, like during that, like the current state, the outputs represent the current state. So like think about your assignment, right? With your assignment, you had to have outputs for like the filling station and the filling station, the output needed to be legit whenever there was a bottle there. And that was the entire time that you were in a state where there was a bottle at that station. And so because of this, the outputs are stable for the entire duration of the period of the clock. And so you can sample whenever you want there. So we can see that the difference between a million and more is that Mores are good for um, circuits that have like combinational uses for the output. So the outputs need to be stable all the time, like your LEDs for the bottling machine. 
Um, but a mealy machine is good for when you have a system that samples the data coming out from your your mealy system because it only has to be stable around a particular clock edge. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, does that make sense, Nicholas? Uh, cool, awesome. Okay, so let's um, let's go and do. Um, oh, we forgot to write out the the state table. My bad. All right, let's go and do this. A, B, C, D. Uh, nothing's going to change here from the previous one in terms of next states. We're still going to have B, C, A, D, C, A, D, B. And the outputs, well, A corresponds to a zero, B corresponds to a one. I'm looking at the red diagram down the bottom if anyone's confused. C, one, D, zero. Perfect. Okay. Um, so now we're looking at the more machine for the rest of this question. And the first one is choose and list binary code assignments for the states. That's really easy. Okay. Let's just go and say that this is going to be zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Perfect. So, okay, maybe I should write that a little bit more clearer. Let's uh, let's go and say that A is equal to 0, 0, B, 0, 1, C, 1, 0, D, 1, 1. Cool. All right, so now that we've gone and done that, um, we're looking at part five, which is derive the flip-flop and output equations. So uh, we're doing with D flip-flops. So that's nice and easy, but we need to just um, extend our um, our truth, uh, our state diagram, state table um, a bit here. So I'm going to move this over to the side. Oh, actually, no, I'm just going to rewrite it completely. Um, I'm going to write the present state in terms of the actual binary codes now. And what I'm going to do is I'm further going to specify that because we've got four states, we need two flip-flops. So we're going to go and say that we need um, Q1 and Q0. So this would be Q1 and that one's Q0. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Cool. So now we've got our present state. Um, we need to have a look at the next state and the next state um, depends on whether X is 0 and X is 1. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add another column here for X. So rather than having it like before where we split it kind of into two columns, I'm now going to basically um, merge it into one. So that means that for a state of zero, zero, I can have an input of zero, but also for a state of zero, zero, I could have an input of one. So now it makes two rows in our truth table. And we go and do that for every one of our states. So we're listing out every possible combination of our present state and our input. So that's going to be zero one zero one zero. Oh, uh, screw that one up. Zero one 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 zero zero one zero one 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 zero one one one. So that's all our combinations of our present state and our input. And now we can have a look at our next state. I think the easiest way to write this is to say Q one of t plus one. So that's like the next time or the next state, and Q zero of t plus one. And then we've, of course, got our output as well, uh, Y or Z. I think it was Z for this question. And so we need to go and fill these out. And so um, for a D flip-flop, that's really easy because all we do is we just list what the next state is. There's a bit more work involved for the JK flip-flops, which we might do in a second time permitting. Um, but let's have a look at how we do this for the D flip-flops. So the next state when you have a state of 0, 0, and our input is 0, is going to be B. And so in our uh, table here, we're going to write out uh, B, which is 0, 1, and the output was going to be 0 for that one. Um, the next one is going to be C. So when we have an input of 1, but our present state is 0. And so to fill that one out, we're going to go 1, 0, and of course, still an output of 0. And we're going to go and speed run the rest of these and say 0, 0, 1, uh, D is 1, 1, uh, 1, C is 1, 0, 1, A is 0, 0, 1, and then we've got uh, the last two is D and B, so 1, 1, 0, B is 0, 1, and 0. So you don't have any questions about how I got that table from the state table? Cool. Um, so for 2 plus bit inputs, it's 2 to the n minus 1 rows. Uh, yes, so if we had another input there, I would have added it like 
um, like X2. And then we would have had to have like a zero, one, zero, one sort of thing, as in like there would be double the amount of um, the amount of rows there, uh, Sarah. Okie dokie. Um, we've done that. Now we've just got to do K maps to get the actual um, the actual input equations and the output equations. Uh, we should do maybe do the K maps for this one, and I won't for the JK flip flops, and that can be your homework, lol. Um, so let's have a look at this one for our Q1. So I'm going to say this is Q1 T plus one. Uh, we're going to write out a K map, and this is going to be uh, well, we've got Q1. Q zero X, and so my K map's going to look like so, and I'm just going to follow down and put those into my K map as per usual. Hopefully, you guys are like amazing at this by now. And what have we got? One zero one zero. Okay, so I filled that one out, and I like to write it like this so I can see when each of the terms is true. Cool. And so we can probably see that the two um, essential prime implicants that we want to use are going to be these two here. And so our Q1 of T plus 1 is going to be equal to the first one, which is just X Q1 bar plus the second one, which is X bar Q1. Can anyone simplify that for me? XOR, XOR yeah. So this is just an XOR of... Oh, I screwed that up. Um, cool. Of X and Q1. Sick. Sorry, XOR, sorry, XOR is that and also like X dash Q dash. Q1 dash plus. X. That's an X norm. Oh, that's it. X norm. Yeah. So if we were to change it to be like, uh, how do I do this? Like if for some reason what you got was this, right? That's the next one. Okay. How that works? I don't know. Bully now, bro. Right? Oh, okay. yeah, I've, just, yeah. I've just met and memorized it, okay? Yeah. Uh, okay. So we'll leave it like that. Um, lastly, we should do Q0, T plus 1, and just quickly work out the K map for this one as well. All righty. And so we've got Q1, Q0, X. So that would be Q1. Q zero X and we got one zero zero one and zero zero one one. Cool. And then this one is a slightly more disgusting thing. It looks like that and then like that and then like that. And so our um oh no. And so our, uh, our equation is going to be Q0 T plus 1 is equal to um, X Q0 plus uh, Q0 Q1 plus um, the lone one X bar Q0 bar Q1 bar. Disgusting. All right. So that's our um, two input equations. The output equation... Uh, we should quickly do it. Um, we need to do a, a K map on the output Z. Uh, otherwise, I have to do it later. And so, so let's say Z. Cool. Q1, Q0, um, X. And so again, Q1, Q0, X. All righty. So 0, 0, 1, 1. One one zero zero for the output, and that's nice and easy. It's just this one and that one. So Z is Q one Q zero bar and Q zero Q one bar, which is just an exclusive OR of Q one and Q zero. All right, everyone happy with how we got the equations? Um, any questions about the equations? No. Uh, and then draw the logic diagram. So just draw that out. Does anyone want me to draw it out? No, it's pretty chill. Cool. Awesome. Uh, if I have time, I'll draw it out before I upload it. 
Um, JK flip flops. Should we do JK flip flops? No, we're happy. Okay, JK is slightly different. It's the assignment. Yeah. It's the assignment, right? Yeah. Um, we're happy with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will probably write it out later and provide the working in case you want to go back and have a look at it. Um, but I think, yeah, good time to move on. Okie dokie. Uh, that brings us to question three and a five minute break. So let's have a break and you can come and like in person, feel free to come and ask me questions online. Feel free to put stuff in the chat. Uh, we'll come back at 3.20 and finish off the last two and a bit questions.
for random points in time. Apologies for those online. Thank you for like yelling at me. Um, cool. What we had just said when you couldn't hear me was that um, there are the quest first question is asking us what type of sequential circuit. There are two types, remember, there are Mealy and more. And the difference between them is that for a Mealy machine, the outputs depend on your input and your current state. Whereas for a more machine, the outputs just depend on the current state. And then what we were saying is that there are three sections to this code here. And if you recall from your uh, lab seven, like when you were writing the timer, this was the first one was the state register. The second one was your next state logic. And the last one was your output logic. And so if we look at the question, the question is, is it merely or more? And we really want to look at the output logic because the output logic tells us whether or not the output depends on the current state. And the input, in this case, depends on what? It just depends on the state. It just depends on the state. It, it depends on the state. Oh, no, no, no. And, and the so input, and X as well. Um, cool, so it depends on X as well. Uh, so because of that, because we've got this X here, and that X determines things, like what the output is going to be, it is therefore going to be a merely system. Um, before we go any further, does everyone understand what something like this means? It is. Is anyone not sure what that means? Does anyone want me to talk about it? Yes? Cool. Um, so what this is, is it's basically a condensed if-else, as our friend just said before. Um, what we have is we, we've got like a condition, and then we've got an exclamation, sorry, a question mark, and then we've got what I'll call the true condition, the, the true, sorry, the true uh, value and then a colon and the false value. And that's the end of it. So what this means is that this whole statement will condense into either the true value or the false value, depending on what the condition is. So if the condition is true, then this one becomes whatever the true value was. Um, and if it was false, it will go and be whatever the, the false value was instead. Um, and so if we have a look at this particular example on this line of code for state B for the output logic, we can say that this basically condenses to well, what, what it like expands to, sorry, that's a better way of saying it. If X is equal to 2-B11, then Z becomes equal to 1-B1, uh, else Z becomes equal to 1-B0. So it's really just a condensed form of an if-else statement. So just remember that when you get to your exam if they throw you a sneaky ternary operator. Uh, yes, Muhammad is on the point there, ternary operator. Cool. The second part of this question says, what type of modeling is described by the above Verilog HDL code? Uh, what are our types of modeling? Yay, we've all done the assignment. How good. Okay, so we've got structural. Uh, remember that structural is when we do stuff like we actually like instantiate an AND gate um, with like, I don't know, some wires uh, or whatever, something like this, right? Is you actually know they're different, but they will result in pretty much the same thing, right? Because that also describes it pretty well structurally, yeah. which is why your assignment was like you can use structural data flow interchangeably for yeah. your second model, right? Um, okay, so structural looks something like that. Data flow... So is yeah. Um, just one question in the assignment. Yeah. If we wanted the structural, can we do a? Do we have to very long it or can we do a schematic and then? Uh, there should be no schematics. Unless there should be no schematics. Unless you're using the schematic as like your logic diagram for showing what it looks like, you shouldn't have had a schematic. So you have to implement it through coding. Yeah, either using one of these modelings, right? This is yeah, yeah. all these modellings are unrelated to the the schematic editor. In fact, if you look at what the schematic editor actually does, it will just condense it into Verilog anyway. It's just a GUI for you to draw your circuit. Okay, um, and because we're not kindergarten students anymore, we shouldn't be relying on drawing schematics and a schematic drawing tool. Um, all right, so Dataflow uses stuff like assign. Uh, for example, assign, in, if we wanted to do the end, it would be like W1 equal to A 
uh, however you do the ampersand thing, that um, B. And so that would be the data flow. And then finally, the last one you guys said was behavioral. Um, and what's the trademark of a behavioral model? Always at. Cool. And so we can have a look at this and say it's clearly a behavioral model because of the, the always at. So let's underline that in red to say that it's a behavioral model. Uh, yes, Nicola, it is behavioral. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next part of this is to draw a state table and a state diagram. And I honestly can't be bothered. We've just done that. So let's not do it again. Um, and the next question is kind of interesting, though, because it's all about how you um, how you sample a mealy machine. So a more machine is really easy uh, because the outputs don't change during your state. But with a mealy, it does change. So when you sample it, before you change the input, before you change the output, um, that's what we need to, to talk about. So let's pull this down. I'll put it down the bottom and then do my working up the top. So for this one, um, when, you have, when you have a mealy machine, the way that you work through, because it's saying if you look at the question that we've got to apply some sort of input to it and work out what the output is, there's, uh, there's three steps to this. The first one is we're going to change the input. So whatever it says the input's going to be, we're going to change the input. The second thing, we're going to read the output. And the third thing, we're going to like cycle the clock. So give it a clock edge, right? So that's our that's our process there. Make sure you follow that and you'll be fine. If you screw around with one and two, mix them up, then that's probably not going to be great, right? So make sure you change the input, read the output, and cycle the clock. And the most important thing there is that you read the output just before the edge of the clock, um, which is what your lecture slides say. Okay, so let's maybe do the first like three or four um, of this one, and then I'll let you do the rest because otherwise it just gets repetitive. If we start in state A, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write that we're in state A initially, and we have an input of 0, 1. Remember, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my input first, then read the output, and then and then move on to my next state. So if I have an input of 0, 1 when I'm in state A, what is my output going to be? A. The output. Oh, okay. <laughs> if x is 0, 1, oh, zero. right, because that condition there is false, therefore we're going to look at the false value, which is 0, and so our output there is going to be 0. I'm just going to write that there. And as Asama just said, our next state is going to be A. All right, the next set of inputs is uh, 1, oh, sorry, it should be um, 0, 1. It's the other way around. So let's write it. Inputs were 1, 0. The next set of inputs are 0, 1, because I got them around the wrong way. Not that it matters. Um, and you have 0, 1, and if we're in state A, that's still going to have an output of 0, and our next state looking at A is also just going to be A. Um, if this doesn't make sense to anyone, just stop me as we're going. Is it making sense to everyone so far? Um, how do I read it? Is it 0, 1, or 1? Uh, as in, this is going to be like, like most significant first. So, oh, okay. next one. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I flipped it. Yeah, yeah. It's just weird because they put x0 at the beginning. I'm like, yeah. Anyways, the next one is going to be 1, 1. And so, with an input of 1, 1 when I'm at state A, now this, this condition here becomes true because now x is equal to 2 dash b11. And so, um, we're going to have an output of 1. And if we look at our next state, the next state is going to be then b for that one. Cool, maybe we'll do one more and then we'll move on uh, in the interest of time. And so the input now is going to be zero. What is it? One zero. Thank you. Uh, and if we're at state B and our input is one zero, uh, that condition is false. It's the one that I've circled in red. And so that's going to be an output of zero. And our next state is going to be what? D, because that's true. Perfect. All right. Any more questions about this? Cool. Um, yeah, so the last part worth seven marks is probably what you want to think about. And this is why I really, really want you guys to understand what Lab 7 was trying to say. Um, it's saying, it says that if we were to synthesize this code, uh, what would it look like in terms of actual logic gates? Now, because behavioral, that's slightly different, to, that's slightly difficult to understand exactly what it would directly map to. But 
it always comes down to these three components, the state register, the next state logic, and the output logic. And um, if you remember from your labs, there was this beautiful diagram from lab seven um, where we had our state register was represented by flip-flops, right? Yeah. So in this case, D flip-flops. We had something here called the next state logic and that sampled the current state and also well i should draw that a little bit better um that took the current state and our input x um and we or whatever our input was and generated the the next state and then finally we have our output logic this is a melee system, so the output depends on the input and the current state. And so we're going to take the current state and our input and generate our output from that. And of course, this is going to be our clock here. Does that make sense about like how this should be structured? Now the only thing is like your state register is literally just like this stuff here, right? Uh, how many bits are in our state? Two, so it's going to be how many flip flops? Two, two. two. cool. Um, and then we can think about our next state and output logic. And so what you got to do then? This is our next state logic. Um, probably time to draw up a state table, right? Draw up a state table. Exactly what this says. It tells you what the next state is going to be for any given input. And then you're going to do your flip flop input equations and come up with the actual logic involved with doing that, right? So take your code make a state table out of it and then derive the input equations and that's just going to be what is in your next state logic up there and then finally you're also going to do the same with your output logic using that same state table just do a k map and figure out what the output logic should look like does that make sense to everyone yeah does anyone want me to go through the steps of actually doing it no okay but we did this in a how we derive the feed with j over the t yeah and it might this Pretty much. The, the leap here is that you're not going from a state diagram to a state table. You're going from very log code to a state table. But as long as you visualize that this is the state register, that's the next state, don't just look at it and freak, right? That's the worst thing you can do. Look at it logically, break it down into hopefully it'll look like this, and then draw your state table and go from there. Cool. Any other questions? Sick. We'll move on because we're like seriously running out of time. Um, cool. The last question, the last two parts of this crash course. The first one is just about addition and subtraction. Um, and then the last one is about CMOS. So we'll speed through the addition and subtraction since I covered that in the midterm crash course. Anyways, so we'll just start a new whiteboard. Cool. Um, and the question here is, cool. Um, we have two registers, R1 and R2. So let's let's write them out. So R1, and it says to replace it with your ZID. Um, so mine's going to look like uh, 8 for that first one. And then R2, uh, I think that was a 3 for me. No, it's another 8. My ZID is really interesting. Um, D eight nine five. So those are our those are our two um, registers. And part A is saying that we want to do binary addition. Part B is saying do binary subtraction. And the last part is generate NZCB. Uh, so let's let's do the addition and the subtraction. Then we'll go back and do the NZCV. So um, when we do addition, we're going to take the hexadecimal and write it in terms of the binary representation. So I'm just going to take each digit and write it as binary. So 88A is going to be 1010 and 1 is going to be 0001. And then I'm going to do the same thing with R2. So D, what's D in, in, in binary? 1101. 1101. I'm going to trust you. Um, 8, 1000, 9, 1001, 5, 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay, now we've got our two binary numbers. We need to perform addition on them, and this is just, we'll just go through it real quick because there's like kindergarten maths. Um, 
uh, one zero. Just tell me if I screw it up somewhere. Um, one one zero zero one one zero 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 one zero one 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 zero one. Okay, everyone happy with the addition there? Whenever I shouldn't have to read this is like like maybe math one A or something. So yeah. Sorry, the EP that twelve number, it will be twelve, right? Yeah. So that'll be one one zero zero. Oh no, sorry, C is C is twelve. So C is one one zero zero, and then D is one more, so one one zero one. Yeah. <laughs> He's been lied to. Okay. Um. All right. So yeah, that's that's for the addition. Hopefully, nothing too crazy there. The interesting part for us is going to be the subtraction because we're told that the numbers are in two's complement, I think. Where does it say that? Yeah, two's complement. And so rather than doing the subtraction, which is really disgusting, is there another way that we can do the subtraction instead? Addition. By doing addition. With two's, two's complement. So I can take two's complement of the thing I'm trying to subtract. I didn't get that. Could you try again? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's try them out again. So the, the first number doesn't change. That just chills there. And then the second number we're going to, in order to do an addition, because this is actually just, we're actually doing subtraction here. Um, rather than doing subtraction, we're going to do, still do an addition, but we're going to take the twos complement of this number here and write it down um, here instead. So the twos complement, you can go and do some sort of like minus two, the M plus one or something like that. But the easiest way I find is just to swap every single, like invert every single bit up until the very last occurrence of a one. So the last occurrence of a one in that one was the last one. And I left that one intact and I, I swapped every other, I inverted every other bit before that. Um, and that's the twos complement of that number. Really easy, you don't need to do any sort of weird maths. Um, okay, so now that we've done that, we can do the addition and that will be the same as the subtraction. It just works the same because maths is fun. And then we're gonna have, if we do that, then we're gonna have one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one. Uh, one, zero, one. Okay, cool, that's done. Um, and so that's that's our subtraction. Uh, any questions about how the subtraction works? Yes. Not particularly about this, yeah. but in the midterm, at least in my midterm, we had an integer part and a fractional part. Yeah. And when they asked us to do to find the two's complement, I didn't know how to do it for the fractional part, at least. Because yeah. the concept of complement applies for integers by definition. So sure. how would you go about a complement? I'm going to have a stab. I actually have no idea. I, I don't know. Okay. Um, I haven't thought about that yet. My thought would be that you would just take the two's complement of the integer part and the fractional part would stay the same. I don't know if that would work though. Oh, I got, I got, I think I got a zero. Rip, yeah. yeah I, Sorry. I, I did it. I've, um, both cases. Put on the forum and I'll, um, I'll go, go have a look tonight and one of us, either me or Bina, will answer. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Easy. Sorry, I can't answer that. Um, okay, any other questions that I can't answer? Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, there's a lot of carry and yeah, so hopefully we'll find an answer for you on the forum tonight. Um, okay, so now we've done that, part C was let's determine N, Z, C and V for these, um, these attract, uh, addition and subtraction. So, this was probably the last part of the course that you probably don't remember very, very well. Um, what N, Z, C and V are is that N is like negative. And this is saying, is the result of my operation negative? Z is zero. Is the result of my operation zero? C is carry. Did I have a carry out of my operation? And V is overflow. Was there an overflow in the operation I performed? Overflow is the only real tricky one, and we'll come to that last. Um, negative is really easy. How do you determine whether a number is negative in two's complement? The first bit, right. So if we have a look at our part A, was the result negative? 
No, so I'm going to write a zero there for negative. What about Z? Was this number zero? No. Nope. So we're going to put a zero there as well. What about carry? Was there a carry out? Yes. There was. Okay, so that was a one. Overflow. Was there? Now we can look at that and say there's clearly overflow because we're adding two negative numbers and getting a positive number, right? How do we deterministically work out like whether or not there was an overflow? What we do is we have a look at the the carry out and the very previous carry. So the carry on to the very last bit additional subtraction or whatever operation is. And what we say is that your overflow is actually just C of um, N, which is this one I've highlighted in red, um, exclusive ord with C of N minus one, which is the one that I've highlighted that doesn't exist. Um, so we can write that as like a zero, right? There was a zero carry there. And so in this case, uh, we're going to have one XORD with zero. And what's one XORD with zero? One. one. And so our overflow was one. So that's how you generate the overflow flag from an operation. Does that make sense, the addition? Yes. So we basically look at the final carry and the second last carry and XORD. Right. Yeah, really look at the carry out and the carry and the carry into the very last bit, right? And you do an XOR of those two. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Nicholas has said something about the negative fractional question. Yeah. Um, that could potentially be it. Um, we can confirm tonight. Alex says, when is the case that you get two's complement of the actual answer? Uh, from an operation. Um, never, I don't think. Not with these two anyway. These two are just like, I find. Uh, yeah, I think it was for unsigned subtraction. If you want a review of like unsigned subtraction, have a look at the midterm recording because I go through it there and I have forgotten to revise that before the session today. So that's, you can look at me from like two months ago. Um, okay, the last thing we should do is we should work out what N, Z, C, and V are for the very last for the subtraction here. And so uh, is it negative? Is the last one negative? The yes. One here? yes, because that's a one. So that's gonna be one. Is it zero? No, it's not zero. Um, is there a carry out? There was also not a carry out. What about overflow? No, because they're both zeros, right? And so there was gonna be no overflow um, there as well. Any questions about the subtraction? Yes. Yeah, how could you carry side addition or unsigned addition? Right, and the question, see how it says two's complement? Uh, Up top. I mean, the question doesn't say side or unsigned. But it says that the 16-bit um, long binary codes are sort of two's complement binary format. The two's complement is side, right? Yeah. It implies sign. Yeah. So two's column, one column, they're both signs. Uh, and there's also like just regular sign magnitude as well. That's the third type. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So that was that question. And the very last thing that we want to cover during the crash course, um, and then you can all ask me other questions, is with the, the last one there, it's a CMOS question. So let's start a new whiteboard. Cool. And the, the question is that we should um, have a look at this function H. Again, do like a replacement based on your ZID. So I'll do that in a second. And we want to draw it with CMOS sketch. So I think the two types of questions that you might like probably get if you're looking at past papers is draw a CMOS circuit from an expression or derive the expression from the CMOS circuit. So we're going to go with one of them and the other one's just the inverse. I think this one's the harder one. Um, okay. Before we start, let's do a bit of revision because I imagine that's probably the thing that you're most shaky on with the CMOS stuff. Is that is that right? Yeah. Okay. I'll do a little bit of revision on that. Um, and then we will talk about how we do this uh, because uh, unless you understand exactly what's going on, the process to do it doesn't make sense. So um, with your CMOS circuits, remember that you you they're made up of two types of transistors, which is your, your PMOS and your 
your NMOS. And the way that the overall structure, what we're aiming for here with your circuit, is to basically develop something that looks a little bit like this. So as a PMOS pull-up circuit, your output um, from your function, and it has a MOS pull down. And then that's connected to ground. Um, so that's what we're aiming for. And so what we'll do is talk about what the PMOS and the NMOS do, why they're suited to being up here and down there respectively, and what we need to do to our Boolean function before we actually create the arrangements of PMOS and NMOS. So having a look at our, our PMOS and our, our NMOS, um, they work slightly different. Um, I want to start, let's, we'll, we'll go with the PMOS. Okay, so with the PMOS, it, it turns on whenever, well, I should label this, this is the gate, right? The PMOS turns on, i.e. it sort of conducts from the source to drain. Um, whenever the, the, the gate, so it, it turns on whenever G is uh, low. And so um, that's kind of why we have that little bubble there, because it works the opposite. So PMOS and MOS work like switches, usually. They're either on and they're off. And when they're on, they're conducting across this gap here. And when they're off, they're not conducting across that. So um, PMOSs turn on whenever our gate or our G is low. And then by converse, NMOSs work the opposite way. They turn on whenever G is high. OK. So that's the, the PMOS and the NMOS. Um, when we uh, think about this, uh, because of this turning on whenever the gate is low for the PMOS, it means that when we go to construct our function from the Boolean function, rather than just having our inputs connected to the gate to the PMOS, we want the inverse of the inputs to connect to the gate to the PMOS. Uh, we'll talk about why that is in a second, but let's let's come back to the overall the overall diagram. So the overall diagram, PMOS and NMOS. So we have them separated into PMOS and NMOS because they just work better when PMOS is up near the VCC and when NMOS is down near the ground. I'm not going to go more technical than that. Um, we have them like that. So then the, the idea is, okay, we need to construct our function from these two. Um, what, we, what we do is that because PMOS pulls up to VCC, whenever this circuit is active, i.e. connected, because the switches are either on or off, when it's active, we can see that the output's going to be uh, VCC, right? So whenever this, this PMOS pull-up circuit is on, it's going to be VCC. For that reason, we want to implement F, or our function, the regular function up the top, because that's true. It's like our truth table, right? Whenever the output is 1, we want the output to be left, like on, right? Um, it's different for the NMOS because when the NMOS is activated, it's connecting to ground, right? And so what we would rather do is because this actually, like, whenever this is active, it just means that this is 0 here or 0 volts of ground, um, we actually want to implement F complement down here. The question is stretching. Mr. Raymond. Uh, okay, so because the um, because the NMOS connects to ground, we actually want to implement F complement there. Yeah. yeah. No, still stretching. More stretching. You're all tired. Okay. The other other point is what I was saying before is that what I mean by active is like when it's conducting, right? And remember what I said with the PMOS is that uh, it only activates when the input's low. Uh, that's kind of counterintuitive for us. And so for that reason, when we write the PMOS circuit, we're also going to invert all the literals. And that means that the inputs to each of the PMOSs are going to be inverted, and therefore it will work sort of like a switch in that when the input is on the uh, the actual PMOS will conduct. So it's sort of like putting an extra bubble there to cancel out the bubble on the PMOS. 
still works well when connected to VCC, which is what we want. That's why we've got them up here. But uh, we don't have to worry about the um, the the fact that it, it only turns on when you give it a low signal. So, all right, let's, yeah. Does that mean that the inputs of F in a way would be the dual of constant? That's right. Yeah, it is a deal. But I feel like approaching it like this makes a little bit yeah. more sense. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can see that it would just be the, the deal between them. Okay. So let's go and have a look at the example in this question then. Um, so if we have a look at the function and we substitute my ZID, the fifth number of my ZID is a three. So therefore, our, um, our H, our function H from the exam paper is uh, is going to be... Um, a, B plus C uh, plus B. Uh, and that's going to be that's going to be our function that we're going to uh, create a CMOS implementation for. All right, so let's start with the PMOS side. So remember, I said two things. Firstly, we want to implement the actual function H in this case, but we also want to invert all the inputs. So let's look at the PMOS for this one. Maybe I'll do it in red. Um, if we're going to invert all the in inputs, then H becomes A bar, B bar, plus C bar, plus B bar. And um, that's, that's all well and good. Um, that's fine. And so um, now that we've done that, we probably just need some sort of idea of how to structure the PMOSs to make the pull-up circuit. There's two ways that we can structure our, our MOSFETs. They're either in series, like so. It doesn't matter if they're NMOS or PMOS, they're in series. Or they look like this. And that means that those two are in parallel. And so what we need to uh, remember is that if they're in series, this works like an and or, because if you can imagine, oh, sorry, an and, oh, my bad. This works like an and, because if you can imagine um, these are switches, right? For the whole thing to conduct, you need to have both of them on, right? If only one of them's on, nothing conducts, right? So the whole idea behind this making a conducting path is when it's an end of, for example, A and B here. Does that make sense to everyone? Conversely, we have or when we have them in parallel. And that's because if either one is on, then we can see that we have a conducting path uh, down to the bottom. OK, does that make sense? Cool. Now we can go back to our um, the function that we've got here. And um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify this a little bit because I don't really like all of these uh, all of these uh, terms here and negations. So I'm going to do De Morgan's on this on this one here. If I do De Morgan's, that means I'm going to end up with invert each term, um, and I'm going to just leave a bar, b bar, and I'm going to change the uh, the or to be an and, and so. That's, that's what I get by applying De Morgan's to this one. And of course, I'm just going to leave the, uh, the B bar out the side there. And let's go and, um, and apply De Morgan's again to, to this one. And that's just going to give us A plus B and the double complement on the C will cancel and give us uh, plus B bar. Everyone happy with the simplification that happened there? Cool. Now that we've done this, this is a lot easier than all those negations, right? Now we can just implement this purely in terms of um, our ands and ors that I've described up at the top right there. So and is in uh, series and or is in parallel. So let's have a look at, at what this would look like if I was to describe this with a, um, a CMOS circuit with the PMOSs. So I'm going to have a VCC rail up the top. And the biggest operation here is going to be the OR of these two terms. So I've got an OR, and remember we do an OR in parallel. So that means that 
I'm going to have B bar, which I'm going to have here, in parallel with this part of the circuit, right? And now we've just got to draw the thing circuit in green on the right hand side. Now this is an AND, the biggest, the biggest term, like the biggest like operator here is an AND between A, B and C. And remember an AND is in series. So I'm just going to go and draw that with the C. And again, I need to have the A, B being AND with C. And so I'm going to split that. Remember the AND is, sorry, the or, sorry, OR is uh, in parallel. And so we're going to have A and B there as well. So based on, you just break it in half, like the biggest, the biggest operator first. So OR has like priority, like your order of operations, right? OR has like, the, is like the biggest one. So we do that first. And, uh, and then at the very end, we join everything up together. And that's our PMOS half of the circuit. So two things that we need to remember is that AND is series and OR is parallel, and then we can just go and construct our circuit. So that's H, the top half, the pull-up half. Uh, any questions about the pull-up half of that one? Nope. Okay, the pull-down half then. So the pull-down half, um, we said, oh, let's go back over here to our function. We wanted to have, um, well, it's still in green. We wanted to have H bar, right? And H bar was equal to just the negation of the entire thing. So our, our original equation was um, A, B plus C plus B. And so I'm going to negate the entire thing to, to get our, um, our final, uh, the, the expression for the bottom half, the, the NMOS half of the circuit. And uh, again, looking at this, I don't really like it, so I'm going to do De Morgan's on it. And if I do De Morgan's on it, just bear in mind that my two terms are going to be uh, this one and that one. So if we do De Morgan's on this one, that leaves us with A, B plus C as one term, um, anded with B bar. Cool. So now we've got our expression. We can come back over here and actually draw the NMOS. And it's exactly the same. It's still the, um, the whoops, it's still the uh, series AND and parallel OR. And so looking at this here, what's the first thing I'm going to consider? What gate is the first thing I'm going to uh, consider? The end, right? This, this one, the end here of the B bar and the AB plus C. Remember, end is in series, so this is nice and easy because I can just go and say, all right, that's going to be B bar. Remember, we're drawing with NMOSs now because we're drawing the pull down half of the circuit. Um, now let's have a look at the OR. Ors are in parallel, so we're going to be paralleling a C with A ended with B. And so that just means that A and B are going to be in series and like so. Join them up together, connect it to ground. The very last thing that we need to do is we just need to take the very middle of our pull up and our pull down and say that that's our output H. Okay. Any questions about that one? Any questions online? Can you assume the inverted variables are variable? No, I can't. Thank you. Excellent point. Um, yes, B bar. Uh, I can't actually assume B bar is available. How do I invert something with CMOS gates? Very simple. Simplest CMOS gate you'll ever see. Uh, VCC. There you go. There's your inverter. And uh, we can think about this, right? Whenever B is on, right? So let's let's write a uh, a one here. Um, if B is one, then the NMOS is that on or off? on. Remember, it works like a usual oh, switch yeah, because yeah. there's no bubble there, right? So this is going to be on. We're at the PMOS because it is a bubble. The logic's inverted. So if I give it a, a high, it means it's going to be off, right? And so because of that, there's like there's a, a bridge here and um, the current can flow 
well, not current doesn't flow that way, but like you get what I mean in that this is going to be zero volts or pulled down to zero volts out here. So when there's a one here, we're going to get zero at the output. And conversely, if we think about the case where we have a zero here, the PMOS on or off? On, right, because it's got a little bubble there. So it means like it works differently, like the inverse to what we'd expect. And the NMOS is going to be off. And so therefore, because this one's connected, we're going to have a logic one at the output. Cool? I think there's some questions in the chat here. Uh, how would you express an inverter? Nikhil, hopefully I just answered that question. Uh, what does transmits level one uh, or level zero well mean? Uh, you have to go back to like the actual description of like how a PMOS and an MOS transistor, uh, what MOSFET actually works. Uh, so go back to the lectures as for for why that is, um, it's to do with the like the idea. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I, I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, but the way that a PMOS is constructed means that it transmits a one well. The way that an NMOS is constructed means that it transmits a zero well. Uh, so yeah, you have to have to go back to the lecture slides to work out that one. Sorry, Evan. Um, yeah, and that's kind of why your transmission gate is also made up of both the PMOS and NMOS, so you can transmit both zero and one well. Okay, I think that's potentially all in the paper. Yes? Uh, if we included the do we just like add it to the whole front of the circuit? Yeah, I don't think it matters where you draw it, as long as it's there somewhere. Same thing, right? Same as the other question. Yeah, so like, we have to like split the top and the bottom of the PMOS and the NMOS, right? Right, just draw it separately. Yeah, like I've done here. Um, and yeah, I guess the last part of that question was like, how many? I think we had to count how many. So the number of transistors, let's let's count them. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Can't forget the inverter. Nine, ten. So ten. Ten transistors used um, in total. Uh, cool. That's that's the end of my content. So that works well. We're only five minutes over time. If you have questions, you can feel free to stick around and ask me. Um, I'll be here for a little bit online. Feel free to also ask. Uh, if you have any other content you want me to go over, you can ask me and I can do that now. Um, but I'll probably stop the recording in a second. But yeah, good luck for your finals. Please fill out my experience. It ends today. So give us lots of feedback. Uh, but yeah, good luck for your finals and hopefully see you around sometime. I'm guessing we didn't get the 50%. <laughs> Let's have a look. <laughs> um, you're at 42% this morning, so I don't think so. Damn it. Oh, he said if we get to 50%. What did I get? I, get to I was going to shout in donuts, but uh, <laughs> the whole course? <laughs> the boy, who uh, turned up to the crash course? Uh, which was like, yeah. Um, I was banking on not too many. <laughs> if for some reason you have cracked the 50, I will, I will shout down. Up, but I don't think so. That sounds unreasonable. Hey, could I just ask about my question? Yeah, sure. I did it with Looks awfully like mountain. Yeah, sorry, for the record, you got to 45%, so no donuts. Yeah, but fill in my experience, please. Does that look about right to you? Okay, let's have a look. What was your Z loading? Uh, so So cool. So you're down. So you had uh, B C plus C plus A. Okay. Oh, you would have just factored out the yes. C outside of B plus one, which is always going to be one, which is. Just C, right? C bar plus A. Yeah, that looks fine to me, honestly. Okay, All right. I'm not going to check every part, yeah, yeah, but right. it looks like it should be that. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's just an awesome, right? Yeah. 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 Thank Perfect. you. Yeah. All right. Uh, we will have some questions about half adder, full adder. Uh, not sure. I haven't written you. I haven't seen your exam. Oh. Um, yeah. yeah. So I can't say, but I think that would be a little bit mean. Um, of them to put that in, so yeah. And uh, um, could you pardon that? How did you determine is signed addition or unsigned addition? Right. So because the because the um 
the question said that uh, the the binary codes are stored in twos complement. Yeah. Remember that twos complement is a form that stores the sign, um, like it tells you what the sign of the number is, right? Uh, oh, that's it. Does it? <laughs> Does it? <laughs> yes. All right, I'm probably not going through it now. If you go and have a look at the midterm recording, mm -hmm. you go right to the end, there's about five or ten minutes at the wow. end where I talk about mm -hmm. all the different unsigned and signed addition and subtraction, and I do examples of all of it. So that's probably the, the best place for you to go to, to look at that. But in summary, if, um, if they wanted unsigned, it would have said unsigned, right? Um, but otherwise, they're going to say it's two's complement, which is this one, which is a signed form, or one's complement, or sign magnitude. Those are the three types of sign: two's complement, one's complement, and sign magnitude. At least the three most common types of. Yeah. So yeah, because it's two's complement, I therefore knew it was signed just because two's complement is a signed representation. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Have a look at the video um, from the midterm crash course. It's at the end. And if you have any questions, post uh, on the forum, and I'll, I'll come around and answer it. Okay. So it's also in King's right? Is that a video? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Joe not I. Midterm crash course was it recorded? Yeah, I recorded a segment for the because the they haven't seen addition or subtraction in their midterm ever before. So I added a bit onto the end of last year's recording about addition and subtraction. All right. Yeah. Yes. yes you cool. No worries. See you later. Good luck with you, John. John, I have a question. Um, I was so looking through my grades. Seriously, so have a good one. I was looking through my grades and I. Hang on. Let's that... let's stop recording. <laughs> oh yeah, John. We can just um, chuck this the recording to either me or John. Uh, uh, where I want. Cool.